Social norms related to the gender division of work limits the kind of work that is available to women. Almost everywhere, women bear a disproportionate burden of unpaid care work at home. The types of paid work that are available to women as a result are often informal and marginal. Okay, so yes, absolutely, there is a, diff there is a theory uh, that can explain um, the subjugation and marginalization of women of color on the labor market, and especially migrant women, um, and its intersectionality theory, mainly, looking at different aspects of one's identity and how they impact on somebody's position in society. But it's also looking at the various systems of oppression that impact that position. So in the case of migrant domestic workers, we have our capitalist system, which defines the worth of um, workers on the global labor market. Um, we have the international division of labor, uh, which also defines you know, what tasks are considered to, um, or at least the, the level or the, the level of remuneration as well at work. And then uh, the other factors that play into it are patriarchy, because patriarchy as a system is um, the basis of the heteronormative division of labor, which assigns care work and care um, tasks to women predominantly. And then the last one is um, racism, because racism as a system, so I'm not speaking about an opinion, I'm not speaking about attitudes, I'm speaking about a system, an organizational aspect of our economies, which relies on the hierarchization of people and of workers according to their race, according to their skin color, their ethnicity, their religion, their nationality. And this is what explains the current position of women on of, of uh, care uh, care workers on the labor market. And I want to say something, and I think it's quite important, and maybe not very popular to say, but if we do not question this social hierarchy, if we do not question our current economies economic systems that are based on this very hierarchy, then um, trying to solve the problem of the exploitation of care workers will always be incomplete. It will always be um, uh, treating the symptoms and the symptoms will keep on coming back. We need a systemic change in this field in order to see the rights of domestic workers uh, respected in the long term. Hello and welcome back to this course on decent work for women. You've now reached the third module. How do we get from where we are today to a world where women are equal participants in the economy earn fair wages and have social security. This is the subject of this module. Chief among our objectives must be to transform gendered social norms about how work is valued and what work is considered valuable. That requires action on several fronts. For example, we need to take action to prevent and respond to violence against women and girls, not only in the world of work, but in their homes, in their communities, and in public places. In India, the report of the JS Verma Committee in January of 2013 had recommended a series of reforms to, among other things, India's criminal law, policing systems, and the educational system to enable a safe and dignified environment for the women of India who are constantly exposed to sexual violence. We should also take action to end the stereotypical attribution of genders to roles and abilities that result in discrimination against women. This may be done with children in schools through education that encourages the adoption of gender equitable norms and through advertising and other campaigns that, for example, can communicate positive role models and examples for collective action. Campaigns may be aimed at achieving the redistribution of unpaid care work from women to men. The idea of equal responsibility for care between men and women should be included and mainstreamed throughout the educational system and reinforced through advertising campaigns, community-based behavior change, and support for flexible employment policies to balance work and family commitments. Uh, in a way, to answer this question, the strategy, I think, would have to be two-pronged. One is that we should reduce the inequality and distribution of care work between women and men and encourage men to share the care work with their uh, female members of the household. 
Second, in terms of business and employment, there need to be acknowledgement of the high burdens of unpaid care work that women have to perform. Therefore, allow flexible timings of work. Do not penalize part-time work. Uh, I mean, there are uh, companies and sectors where, I mean, I believe in the IT sector now, even if you do part-time work, there are women who have seen growth um, in their career. Now, help in skilling and reskilling of women. Now, this is very important because a lot of women will have to drop off the labor force at some point, either because of their childbearing duties or other unpaid care duties uh, or various other reasons. Now, when they want to join back, the problem is that the uh, different sectors do not offer any skilling or reskilling for these women to be able to uh, join back at a level where they dropped off or at a higher level. As a result, a lot of these women are very underconfident at the time they join, they bargain for less and they join at a much lower level. So what you need to do is skill and reskill these women when, when they drop out of employment and when they want to come back and rejoin uh, the, the, the sector. Uh, so all of this together would create an enabling environment for them to grow in the company. Now that would collectively create a higher quality of employment situation in the country where the opportunity cost for women to remain or seek re-employment will be better. And I think a large part of our discourse sort of talks about the individual and the employer mediated by the state, right? So for instance, you'll say, oh, you know, you'll talk about education levels, you'll talk about empowerment levels, all of these are very individual centric factors, right? And then you look at government policies, you look at laws, and then this is how we generally try to understand women's work. And what is fundamentally missing in this discourse is the role of the household, right? And this sort of really ties up with gender ideologies, because what, for, like, you know, I mean, very in a very simplistic manner if we had to understand discrimination you look at gender ideology right what are the theories of gender ideology so if you look specifically at gender role ideology you know you have on the one hand you have these traditional ideologies which have a clear demarcation of a different role for men and women in the household and so on and so forth right which is the male breadwinner model on the other end of the spectrum you have uh, more egalitarian ideologies which sort of say that you know men and women they have the same roles both within the house and outside the house and in between you have transitional ideology the whole spectrum of from male breadwinning model to a more egalitarian model right now let's bring this in the context of urban area and women's work so for instance if you we know empirically and this is from ns's data studies clearly show that if you have a child in the house a woman is less likely to work. So then what does this mean? Then this is about care, right? Uh, you're talking about care. So if there is women, so, and so the first role for a woman is to provide childcare. And this, uh, so uh, now let's bring the care element to the state and the employer, right? Uh, if, if women are being held back at home because they have to provide child care, then we really need to look at care in terms of it being institutionalized, whether it's by the state or by the employer. And we definitely know that once this is done, if this is done, there will be some difference. But for instance, I think if, so the maternity, we have a maternity benefit act, right? Uh, there was a new maternity law and they had one of the most generous maternity benefits in in the world so you get full paid leave for six months of course you know this is obviously for the organized sector but this 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 legislation has really not helped in increasing women's workforce participation because childcare doesn't end at six months right so uh, so then what we really know empirically from the data is that ca that care is important for women's access to the workforce what we all simultaneously there's also evidence which shows that if there is an older person in the household or if there's an older sibling in the household women are more likely to work so then this sort of really brings in the whole issue of care so i want to speak a little bit about um, you know in in the 
in the case in the space of uh, care policy uh, unpaid you know the care economy and the policies that uh, can help to kind of streamline care economy in our societies because that's very important and that kind of has an impact on the employment and business uh, sectors as well so Diane Nelson was the first who enumerated the three R's of uh, care work, which is the triple R framework is recognize, reduce, and redistribute care work for better value and improve the su and support the care economy. It was adopted by the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment, established in September 2015. It follows that policymakers must first recognize unpaid care work. So what I was talking about, the fact that, you know, it is taken for granted, it is not recognized, it is not acknowledged in formal systems of economic accounting, etc. So the first thing is to recognize that care work is work. Uh, it, it also includes recognition of social norms, gender stereotypes and power relations and discourses which go out to support and prop up this discrimination and inequality in care work. Now, uh, the International Conference for Labor Statisticians has actually uh, accepted care work as productive work, but, uh, but India has not actually accepted that uh, definition as yet, and we are as Oxfam India, we are kind of advocating that uh, that should be accepted as productive work, that unpaid care work should be accepted as productive work and the ICLS definition should be incorporated into the NSS uh, survey uh, tools. The next is reduction, which is to formulate state policies such as safe drinking water, improved cook stoves, electricity, transport, and other necessary services and equipments, which ease the burden of care work for women. So there's a state responsibility in providing certain basic amenities to women, which allows them, which eases their burden of unpaid care work and allows them the time to free up time so that they can pursue employment and other uh, paid productive labor. The third is redistribution, which encourages that care work be shared between the community and the family. And this kind of stems from the previous uh, uh, policy of reduction. Uh, and between men and women as well and other family members. It involves challenging, challenging gender stereotypes, provision public childcare facilities for working parents and tackling uh, gender discrimination at work. A fourth R was, rep uh, uh, was added uh, by civil society organizations. The fourth R is representation. And this was added by ActionAid, Oxfam, and Institute for Development Studies in 2015. It helps to promote representation of carers in relevant policy making and developing the capacity of carers so that they can be directly included in decision making. And the ILO, the International Labor Organization, added a fifth R, which is reward, as part of their focus on decent work. Appropriate reward for care work is now acknowledged as essential uh, to avoid care drain where women leave their families and possibly also migrate to provide low paid care work to others, thereby leaving their own care work to other family members such as grandparents and uh, older children. Now this is the whole care supply chain globally where um, you know, women from, say, Latin American countries, a lot of Indian women, poor Indian women also, migrate to other countries, other parts of the country, their own countries, to provide paid care work, leaving their own children, their own care work upon the elderly in their villages, uh, or sometimes also older siblings to the children to take care of the younger siblings. And uh, this puts tremendous pressure on the families because, um, you know, none of these people, I mean, older people are not equipped to deal with so much of hard work. Nor are, I mean, if older children are actually taking care of their care work, then uh, they have to drop out of education and uh, do this, uh, perform this work. So, therefore, 
this is a very discriminatory and in unequal system and um, but this this happens i mean this uh, i mean this this happens in india quite uh, quite rampantly and um, so there is a fifth r which tries to uh, address this thing uh, this phenomenon where there is care drain where uh, you know women have to leave their uh, own homes to perform paid care work in other uh, other other locations we've just learned from our experts about the importance of recognizing the unpaid care work performed by women along with that we must also take action to remove the stigma attached to the types of paid work available to women which is mostly the category of informal work informal work makes a substantial contribution to the economies of the world and must be recognized for it as we know the majority of women workers in developing countries and an ever increasing number of them in developed countries work in jobs that are characterized as informal what are the characteristics of informal employment broadly speaking there is no formal relationship of employment with an employer and no social security further unlike what we learned in relation to formal work in the previous module the state does not intervene to protect their collective bargaining rights wages or other conditions of employment the political project of visibilizing care um has many different facets to it the first one is to represent care work as not a natural inherent aptitude that all women possess but as an actual work that is being um that is being performed by uh, women and also a few men but also young girls and also young boys on the planet and that this type of work um is work so we need to elevate care work to the level of work because in a capitalist society that really re, um that relies on the idea of um wage labor you know in order to grant uh status in order to grant pay and and a, a labor protective framework it needs to happen that's also the same with um sex work in a sense um and so the first step is to do this the second step is to um involve or at least to rethink the way we have thought about growth about economic growth and to add the uh bulk of reproductive work reproductive work being also care work that is being done to uphold our economies and um and so in order for this to happen we need to have metrics and measurements of the value that is created through care work so this is the second step the third step is to um underline the um, or at least question the international labor uh, international uh division of labor uh which is stratified by gender but also by class and by race and nationality immigration status of course but all falling into the race aspect i would say and in that sense um if we understand that um the level of pay the level of protection the level of the, the status that workers enjoy is related to their identity to their their you know the the country where they're from to the language that they speak to their ethnicity then we can um uh fulfill this project of visit or making care work visible because we can also value the contribution of people who are considered to be dis uh, disposed disposable workers Governments also tend to ignore the informal economy in planning and policy making and impose prejudicial measures on informal work. For example, urban planning often does not recognize the economic value of street vending. Vendors as a result often have to contend with various taxes or bribes and evictions from public spaces. The reason we started one on law is because the mainstream negative narrative is that the informal workers are outside the reach of the state by choice they choose to remain outside and yet what they experience is daily harassment evictions confiscations you know to them the state is omnipresent in their lives in a very negative way right 
And so we wanted to start by saying, you know, the state can be there in a punitive way or in a protective way. And right now the state uses law punitively. So like in India, if you're a street vendor and you're not, this is before the new law, but if you were a street vendor and not licensed, you were treated under the criminal code by the police. And the street vendors could cite chapter and verse from the criminal code because that's when they were issued summary warrants or had their goods confiscated or evicted. This, they were under the criminal code. And so we've had to really show that they've never been outside the reach of the state. It's just that the apparatus and the legal frameworks are biased towards um, formal, right? I mean, you think, uh, I'm not a labor economist. I work on labor, I'm an anthropologist, but labor economics, the notion of supply and demand in labor markets and market clearing, that only works in labor markets where everyone is wage employed. If you're self-employed and your labor market is half or two thirds or three quarters self-employed person, the whole concept of supply and demand doesn't work because what is the demand for the self-employed worker? It's a demand for their goods. It's not a demand for their labor. They're supplying their own labor, right? So you have to think extremely differently, right? The same that we had to change labor force statistics um, and we're still doing it. For instance, in labor force statistics, we're doing this with the HILO. The main categories, you're an employer, you're an employee, you're an own account worker who's self-employed, not hiring others, or you're a contributing family worker who works in the family firm headed by the own account worker, or you're a the member of a co-op, but nobody measures that. So there were four categories, employer, employee, whatever. So where did the home workers fit in that? Think about that. Where did the home workers fit? Where did the casual day laborers fit? Um, where do other dependent contractors like truck drivers and all of that, right? Most of them were classified by the statisticians under own account self-employed, right? Because they weren't employees in the standard sense and they weren't employers, but they were classified as self-employed, right? But so many of them are dependent, right? But not in the employer employee sense, right? So we have now gotten added to the status and employment classification, a new category called dependent contractor which will include the Uber drivers, it'll include the home workers, it'll include the so-called independent truckers who don't own their truck, don't set their routes, don't set their prices, don't do anything, right? They're misclassified deliberately by the lead firm as independent contractors, but they're actually dependent contractors. And so this has been a big battle. So we're, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to challenge the existing frameworks that do not reflect the reality of this work. And I'd say to all the ILO people, you know, and labor economists, you know, it's not labor regulations that impact most of the informal workers, right? Because most of them are, a few of them are employees, but and a few are employers that hire others, but like 2%, right? Most of the vast majority are own account workers or contributing family workers, right? Now we know the own account are often misclassified and some will end up in the dependent, but that's where the majority are. And that's, it's not labor regulations that are impacting them. It's, if they're urban, it's the city's rules and regulations. It's if they're in agriculture, it's the rules around agriculture. I mean, look at the farmer protests in India right now, right? It's, it's those rules and regulations. It's not um, labor regulations that are affected. But the whole world of labor, labor regulations, labor organizations, labor statistics are just there. It's all organized around the formal wage worker and it's not the reality of work. So 
In this video, we arrived at a broad agenda for the transformation of gendered social norms about what work is considered valuable. We learned that we must recognize and redistribute the burden of unpaid care work and recognize and mainstream paid informal work. What kind of state policies will pursue this agenda and lead us towards this transformation? In the next two videos of this module, we will learn through some examples. Thank you for watching.